everybody calls me Banky, that's the name that I got from my grandmother when I was young. I'm coming out here after 30 years, yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm going to have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love, my family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts. What up? Shout out to everybody out there on Team Bank and Pam, man. Much love, man. I appreciate the support. Um, we back, we back on this journey, man. We we rolling through these prison stories, man. Um, yeah, uh, if y'all out there, if you ain't subscribed, man, I appreciate the love, man. P please go subscribe. Check your status. A lot of people watching, but they may not know if they subscribed or not. Just take a little time and check, man, and hit that little button. It helps out a lot. You know, like these videos, comment in these videos. It helps it, the, the, the page grow and we can reach more people with this positive energy, man. These lessons and blessings that we're trying to spread all over. And if you ain't subscribed to my new channel, man, Banky Pam Pure Deliciousness, where we cooking over there, we whipping, we whipping, we cooking it up over there, man. A lot of different ways, a lot of different things you might not have ever seen before. So come over there and join us too, man. Subscribe and come up. Uh, Get this good positive energy, man. This good positive food, man, that we eating over here. Um, everybody out there, man, 2022, man, we're going to try to do our best to give you uh, the best content we can give you. I'm going to try to keep on pushing, man. TBP, I appreciate y'all always having my back and riding with me. And um, we're going to try to do as uh, many videos as we can possibly do in 2022, man. So y'all just ride on with me like i told you it's 33 years of prison stories so i don't know if i'm gonna run out i don't know if y'all gonna get tired of hearing me but we're gonna just keep on going and see what happens you know so yeah man i leave uh i leave mecklenburg and i end up going to augusta no not augusta i end up going to greensville greensville man greensville i go to greensville in 93 right Brand new prison. Greensville, if I'm not mistaken, had just opened in 1990. So when Greensville opened in 1990, you're talking about a brand new institution. So if you got a brand new institution, most of the time on a brand new institution, man, it's out of control. It's out of control because you have uh, convicts there that has been, is being shipped from other institutions like me coming from Mecklenburg. You got convicts coming from all over to, to, you know, fill up these band spaces in this new institution. So when you got that, you got people who've been doing time and got a way of doing time and got knowledge about doing time versus you got a new institution. You got all these new officers who just getting jobs just their first time even being working in the Department of Corrections. So they learning on the job. You know what I'm saying? They learning on the job, which is so ironic because they have control over your life and they don't even know what's going on you know they don't even know anything about prison they fresh off the street you got officers that's 18 19 years old 22 25 and you got dudes that's been locked up 10 15 20 30 years and you trying to dictate to them you know what to do how to do and when to do so it's a conflict of interest man it's just a crazy situation when you when you got a brand new institution that's open and with that being said, the, you know, the administration always going to somewhat be running the prison. But in those beginning stages, those first years, maybe anywhere from one to five to six years, man, the compound is out of control because the, the, the convicts is going to dictate what's going on on the prison. They're going to dictate the pace and what's going on. They're going to have the, the officers is going to have to be learning what's right and what's wrong, what you can do and what you can't do opposed to what they've been told. They're going to have to learn the boundaries of how far they can go because uh, the convict's going to push the boundaries to the limit. That's a given. That's guaranteed. So, you know, I'm coming there in 93, you know, uh, leaving uh, the uh, madhouse, which was, you know, Mecklenburg. And um, man, I'm excited to 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 get on an open spread because this is an open spread. And if you don't know what an open spread is, like I told you, the only open spread I had been to prior to this was Augusta. And what I mean by open spread is when when they open these doors in the morning, you could just go. You know, you go to the rec yard. You go to you, you know you go to breakfast first, then you go to the rec yard, or you go to the gym, or you moving around. 
you know, freely without, you know, you know, all this confinement. When I was in uh, Southampton receiving, um, you know, it's controlled movement because it's just receiving. You're not really on the open compound yet. They had the Southampton farm, which is different. And you could get assigned there. When you leave receiving, you get assigned to the prison you're going to. You could get assigned to the farm, so you just go right across the street, which is the, the Southampton Institution. That's the correctional center. I was in the receiving. So I'm in control movement in there. When I leave there, you know, I go to the wall. When I'm in the wall, 500 Spring Street, they somewhat control movement too because they just coming off these lockdowns from all of the killing and stabbings and stuff they had going on up there. So it's control movement too. You're moving around within the confines of, 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 of that block, which still may be close to six to 800 people. So you're moving around within the confines of that block, but you're not moving around on the open spread with the whole population. So, you know, Mecklenburg, same thing. You know, you moving around just with the, the confines of that little institution. It's, it's somewhat open, but Mecklenburg, like I say, is a smaller institution. It's a smaller institution. So I hadn't really been on the open spread where you could just, you know, move around, like I say, besides Augusta, when you go out there. Like I told you, Augusta, when I went on the yard, it was like baby Vegas out there. I mean, everything going on. So when I get to Greensville, it's the same thing amplified because it's new. And these dudes down here is on what we call flatland. Flatland is meaning like, you know, down in, 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 in the rural areas. When you was in Augusta, you up there in the mountains. And, you know, you're around all these racist people, you know, the, the people that run the institution. They, 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 you know what I'm saying? They different. They ain't used to being around, you know, people like me or my, my color. So it was different. You know what I'm saying? You in the mountains and you basically they got total control of everything going on. Right here, we on flatland. Almost all of the officers is is uh black. Uh the, almost all the, the convicts is black. So it's different, you know. So this is flatland, and I'm telling you right now, it was it was crazy, it was out of control. Um I can remember when I first went in the first block. That I went into. I'm walking in with my boxes and everything. And as soon as I walk in the block, um, I, I'm already in just shop right there. Because when you walk in the block, is the booth is right here, right up to your right hand side. Then it's the big part. It's big part, real big part. Too was the almost the size of Augusta, like Augusta. Augusta and Greenville had like the biggest, probably the biggest parts that I went on. So it was a huge part, man, and I'm looking around and I'm like, whoa. But when I first walk in, the first thing I do is you 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 got to go to the booth and find out what cell you in. So when I go to the, I'm trying to go to the booth to find out what cell I'm in. But as I'm trying to go to the booth, it's somebody already in the booth talking to through the little slot through the officer in the booth. And the only thing I can see is them from the back. And what I'm seeing from the back is like let me know right now that this is going to be a crazy ride because... When I look at the booth, all I see is the back of somebody. They got on a, a, a silk black uh, wife beater and um, some silk uh, black, um, like, uh, what you call it? Um, we used to call them the Dunk the Duns, but they like the um, Fruit of Balloon underwear, you know, the cut ones like that instead of boxers. And it, and, it, and it looked like a woman from the back because I'm like, what is, what, you know what I'm saying? And I'm just saying, oh, I'm like, what's going on? So as they finish, real dark skin, as they finish talking in the booth, they pull away from the booth and they turn around and look back and I can see their face and I ain't going to call their name or nothing, but people who was on there remember who I'm talking about. But man, I'm talking about they, <laughs> this dude look rough, like a man, like, you know, he, he just look rough. And then he started just walking across the block, just switching like a woman. And later on, I found out, you know, it, it was a homosexual, but it was a well-known homosexual that, you know what I'm saying, had a body like a woman, a face like a rough man, and used to be a boxer and can rumble and fight too. So I'm like, man, this is, this is off the chain. This is the first thing I see when I walk in the block. So I'm like, man, this is crazy. So I go to the booth, I holler at the... Um, the person in the booth and ask them, you know what I'm saying, what cell I'm assigned to. I just was coming over here, woo, 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 so they tell me what cell I'm assigned to. 
And as I'm grabbing my box and they open my cell, where I'm assigned to, I'm getting ready to walk across the floor to go to my to my cell. And I start seeing people that I know. People that have been on Augusta with me or somebody that might have been on Mecklenburg with me that got transferred before me or somebody that I knew at Southampton. I'm seeing a little couple of people I know and you know, what's up, bank? What's up? Yo, whoa, whoa. So somebody um holler out, man, said, yeah, man, you know your brother up here. I said, who? They said, Dix. I said, where you at? They said, he in this block. I said, get out of here. So I never forget this, man, because cause <laughs> Dixon always get mad when I say this. So, I, you know, his first name is Leroy. Yeah, I'm telling people your first name is Leroy. So I holler out. He don't like to be called that. So I holler out, oh, Leroy. Hey, Leroy Dixon. Leroy Dixon. Get out here. Man, <laughs> he was in the cell. He come out the cell, stand across the rail. Look down there and see me. He happy to see me, but at the same time, he got this scrawl on his face like, man, what you calling my name out loud like that fool, man? You know what I'm saying? So I just started laughing, but that just gave me a lot of, uh, you know what I'm saying, um, um, you know, different emotions about being on here now because now I see my brother. Now I know the transition going to be even smoother because he here, you know what I'm saying? I got somebody that I really know. This is my ride or die dude right here. This, this, this is my brother. So I feel like more confident about, you know, the transition on this camp. Because usually when I first go on an institution, I'm already, you know what I'm saying? I'm in war mode because I don't know who I might see. I don't know who I might encounter somebody I had beef with. I don't know how they current it on the camp. I don't know how they may look at me, don't know me. So you always got to have all these triggers in your head about what's going on when you come on a brand new institution. You got to be prepared. Somebody could run up on you as you walk across the floor with this big old box in your hand. So, um, yeah, man, so 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 uh, Dixon was in there, man, so it was cool. I go to my cell. He come over there. We chopping it up. You know, uh, I was lucky enough to get a cell. We won't nobody in it yet. But I didn't know if they was going to bring somebody. Usually when you go to a new cell like that and ain't nobody in it, you getting assigned to that cell because it's open and someone else may be coming right behind you getting assigned to it as well. So as soon as I go in and he come down there, we chopping it up and I'm telling him, ain't nobody in the cell, man. Come on, man. Tell the people move you over here. So I don't even know who his cell partner is or, or, you know, if they cool or whatever, whatever. But, you know, this is my brother. So he was like, yeah, I'm going to go try to get moved over here just like that off the rip. Because like I say, that was my dude, you know. So, uh, man, I was fortunate enough that he ended up getting moved in the cell. So now me and him cell partners again, we, we, you know what I'm saying? I'm good, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, boom. So now all I got to do is learn the layout of the institution, what they doing on here, how they current it, how the police acting. Uh, how the dudes on here? I mean, what's going on? You need to know all of these things. You need to know the dynamics of the atmosphere that you in. So, you know, he, he bringing me up to speed on this, that, and the third, and who in the pod is, you know, think they tough, who in the pod is doing this, who in the pod is trying to get money, who in the pod, you know, all of these things. And this officer act like this. This officer act like that. So, you know, he just giving me the game, man, and, um, it was it was crazy, man. I can remember those times, man. And uh, you know, we just got into a routine. You know, Dixon, like I told y'all, man, he's he's a heck of a basketball player. Always been in the top ten basketball players on any institution he's been on. Maybe the top five. He he just could ball real good. So you know, that was his thing. He played basketball, you know. And uh, I played some too. And I would I would like to tell y'all that I was just as good, but you know that would be uh, untrue. You know, but I had a decent shot and I still got a decent shot. But as far as all of that, you know, playing with the with, with dudes that was just super elite in basketball, that wasn't my thing. You know, my thing was these. And they had that up there, which was great. I was, you know, like I say, trying to immediately find out how the boxing program was going on, how it was going, can I get it get with the program, can I get in and everything. And and that's what I uh, you know, seek to do after that. And <laughs> then I got into, I'm seeing the dudes in the block, all the gambling going on. You go out on the yard, they gambling out on the yard, man. They shooting dice, they playing poker, uh, they playing basketball, you know, horseshoes, baseball. It's just a lot going on and, and it's a big, big yard. So, you know, you get out here, you trying to put faces, you know what I'm saying, with names and learn people and see what's going on. And, you know, like I say, 
I got the training, working out, doing what I had to do, trying to get in, in shape and everything to get, you know, jump up in that ring and, and get some work. And at the same time, though, I, I jumping in the poker games. You know what I'm saying? I want to play poker. You know, I got that fever already. I jumping in the poker games. I'm uh, starting to gamble, man. I'm shooting dice. Dice was 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 really one of my. Uh, I love I, I love poker at the time, but I really love dice because. I knew how to shoot dice before I came to prison. I didn't know how to play poker before I came to prison. So dice was something that I always had luck in. I was real good at dice, but I always had trouble with it because I always end up getting in good lucky streaks and winning and get to talking and running my mouth and people don't like it, which end up being, you know, confrontation. But that was just the way I shot dice. That was my adrenaline. That's what I did. And I, I almost always got in confrontation shooting dice. But I always did it, you know what I'm saying? But that was um, what I got into, man, you know, gambling, you know, shooting a little basketball, training for the boxing, and, you know, waiting to get in some of these matches and everything. Because like I told y'all, at that time, man, they had, you know, military dudes coming in to fight. Um, they had, you know, matches there where you was matched up against other people on the compound to fight. So it was a good, it was a good thing for me, man. And I was just trying to get in mode just trying to get, you know what I'm saying, get in where I fit in to get things going. Then I started, you know, store box, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to run the store. I was trying to really, at the time, in retrospect, looking back, I was really trying to do too much, too fast. Yeah, I was trying to do too much, too fast. And I'm young, though, you know what I'm saying? I'm young, I'm young, I'm still, you know, in my 20s. And um, it's just like, it, it, it's... You know, it's new and it's somewhat exciting, but at the same time, every night or every day or every count time you lock in that cell, that reality set in that, you know what I'm saying, you locked up, you know what I'm saying, you ain't got your freedom, and, and you know, it's it's uh, it's rough, you know what I'm saying, so you're trying to make the best out of a bad situation, but that always lingers in the back of your head, you know, don't don't get too comfortable, man, because you you still incarcerated and you still surrounded with a bunch of danger and a bunch of people that you don't know, bunch of different personalities, characters, uh, you know, uh, officers with attitudes and you know what I'm saying, their own problems, and they try to take it out on you because they they can't, you know what I'm saying? They could be at home any day and every day and be having all of this going, on, and then they'll come in there and act like. You know, they're on top of the world, but they, they, they life could be in shambles on the street. But when they got them attitudes that they can't, you know, express to their significant other, their husband, their wife or whatever, because they're afraid or whatever the situation may be. And they come in there with all that, that frustration on them and they take it out on you. And you ain't got no choice but to take it on the chin because anytime you rebel or say anything, you know, to them as aggressive as they say something to you, then it's going to be a penalty for you to pay for that. And a lot of my charges, I started catching charges then, you know, um, on Greensville. A lot of them came from that alone, you know, not allowing the uh, officers to talk to me any kind of way they wanted to talk to me. You know, um, they say something smart to me, I say something smart back. They curse me, I curse them, you know. And the first time they feel like you, you know, you getting out on them, then they'll just say they threatened by you and next thing you know, you locked up you know, for uh, threatening the officer or something like that. And it, it was crazy, but I was learning it as I went, you know, because like I say, it was <clears throat> definitely a different, different atmosphere on Mecklenburg. Mecklenburg officers ain't do no whole lot of jaw jacking because they knew what the count was. You know, they knew who, who was on that compound and they knew that anything could happen. So this was kind of new, the way they, you know what I'm saying, talk trash to you on there because they already knew, like I said, they got the numbers, no matter what, you're not gonna win. You know, they coming at you 10, 15, 20 deep, and you're going to the hole, and you're you going to have to hope that they don't try to whoop you while you handcuffed up and everything like that on your way back there or when you get back there. So, you know, like I say, all that stuff I was learning and the institution I was learning, and just as I felt like I was getting in like a, a, a good mode where I had my routines every day and I, I knew what was going on, boom. They come move Dixon, man. They come move him. He going on the other side of the yard because they got him on the transfer list to go over there. I think he had applied before I got there. He had applied for a job over there in the kitchen. And evidently he got the job. So they come scoop him up 
It ain't like you can say, I, I ain't going, whatever, whatever. They got you on the move list, you got to go. So they moved Dixon, and, um, you know, that was a bummer. You know, that's my man, man, you know. So now I'm over here by myself with a bunch of dudes. I done made some, some, some friendships and things like that, but it ain't like your brother. You know what I'm saying? You know that your brother there, you know your brother got your back, you got his back. These dudes, more or less, that I had just met, they was like associates or whatever. But... You know what I'm saying? But I'm, I'm, I'm rolling solo now. But it's, it's cool because, like I say, I'm kind of in a groove and I know what I'm doing or what I want to do. But at the same time, I'm into a whole bunch of foolishness as well. You know, with the gambling, you know, the dice, the poker. Then you got the store box, which can always bring problems, which eventually did. Because, you know, you, you, you're giving people something on credit, you know. And it's crazy because when you look at it, you in prison, you giving people stuff on credit, taking their word that they're going to pay you when you in an environment where everybody in there for breaking the law. You know, ain't nobody in there can really be trusted, you know, but you taking their word for it in there. But that is all based upon, you know, a, a violence and fear, too. People don't pay you because they honest or because... You know what I'm saying? That's that's their character trait in prison. They pay you because of the consequences of if they don't pay. You see what I'm saying? So that's a difference. So that's what you really, you know, giving someone something in prison for. And it's the same thing in there when they get drugs, man. They give you drugs, you know, based upon, you know, you're going to send some money out or you're going to do this or do that. But it, it goes down like that. And when you're dealing with drugs, you always got to deal with the people that's dealing with pure licensing, man, because they want them drugs whether they got the money for it or not. They still want it. So when they take chances and tell lies and run game, absolutely. You know, so like I said, I had the store box going, man. I got the boxing going. I told y'all a couple of stories about the boxing, man. You know, they had the dude on there, JoJo. Salute to JoJo. JoJo was the man on there as far as in my weight class. They had some mean dudes up there, though, man. Some some real decent boxers was up there, man. JoJo was at the top of the list, most definitely. You know, you had Kung Fu up there. I told y'all the situation later on down the line, what happened with him. You had Kung Fu on there. Um, I told you they had uh, the dude who taught the, uh, the, was the coaches. The two coaches was, was, was pretty good, too. I'm trying to think of one of them, man. He used to be an actual kickboxer, kickboxer on the street. And uh, he was a real good coach as well. The other one was an older dude, had real long arms, who used to box way back in the day. He said he boxed pro before, but at this time that I met him, he was probably like in his uh, late 50s, early 60s. But uh, he used to give up good knowledge about, about the boxing, man. Um, you had a good old team on there, man. A lot of these dudes, I'm seeing their faces. I'm trying to remember their name as I'm telling this story. But, you know, so I got into, I got into that real deep, man, where, you know, I trained every day, I ran every day, I exercised every day, I hit the bag, I skipped rope, you know, and um, that, that was what I was really focused on. But it was my side activities that was, you know, had the drama involved, you know what I'm saying? I ended up getting another celly. Um, I'm trying to remember who he was, but I think he was an older dude. He was an older dude that had been locked up at the time way longer than me, but he was a cool dude, man. He was all right. And that's, that's, that's half a your um, sanity when you're doing time is having somebody in the cell with you that you ain't really got to worry about or you ain't got to worry about no drama or nothing like that popping off. When you walk in that cell, you want to be in your comfort zone where you already got an understanding in that cell of what's going on. It's mutual respect in the cell and things like that. When you don't have that, then you ain't never going to be comfortable because when you walk out of your cell every day, you have to be aware of of your surroundings and what's going on. So you definitely not comfortable. If you are comfortable, then something's wrong. I was in prison for 33 years. I was never fully comfortable. Even after I had established a name for myself, I still was never fully comfortable setting out in a block and you know all of this you know movement going on around me. Because like I say, on Greensville, man, it, it was going down. I mean, it was going down every time you turn around. You could be setting out in a block and you just watching TV or whatever, or talking to somebody, and then you hear all this noise, you turn around, and they getting it in, they rumbling, you know what I'm saying? Or you could hear it and turn around, and, and they they knife fighting. They, I mean, just right there in the block. I done seen knife fights on there. I done seen dudes get bust in the head with locks in the sock. I seen dudes get hit with mop ringers. 
I seen dudes get beat with broomsticks. Um, they just was, it, it was a bunch of young dudes on there as well as the, you know, the influx of, 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 of older uh, convicts was coming in later. But at the time, it was a compound filled with a bunch of young dudes, a bunch of young guys that got a lot of time, a bunch of dudes that don't know how to do time, a bunch of dudes that, you know, might not never get out at all. So they trying to make their name and, 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 and make their mark in prison. And that calls right there for a bunch of confrontation. So like I said, Greensville had it jumping off and the officers did not know how to really deal with it because they was new. Only thing they knew is when they get the call, 1033, that means it's a fight or something going down. They coming. You know what I'm saying? They coming. And on Greensville at the time, they knew they coming like 15 to 20 deep. And they running in there and they first looking for weapons. They make sure you ain't got no knife because they ain't trying to run up into that, that Bethlehem. But when they can see that or they see an opening, they just jump on you. They just bull rush you and attack you. And they got this boom, boom, boom. They just pile all on. You might get 12, 13 uh, COs on top of one dude trying to pin them down. And once they get them cuffed all up, then they drag them on out. And that was their routine. So when they get that call, boom, all over the compound, they just come running, come running, come running. And that that what was going on, at, I mean, like at all times on Greensville. I'm telling you, when I first got there, it might have been at least I know <laughs> in the 90s, man, they early, two, man, they was, man, it might have been a fight every day. Every day, you know, and it might have been some type of uh, Bethlehem or knife play like uh, two to three, four times a week, you know, two to three or four times a week. So this is what you're dealing with. So you got to be on point at all times and you got to be aware of your surroundings because like I say, you don't know who like you, who got some or uh, uh, underline hate for you for whatever reason, man. They hate you on there just because, you know, dudes is going through their own thing. Like I say, everybody's without their freedom. So everybody got some type of built up animosity in them, you know what I'm saying? And looking to, you know, release that energy on somebody, you know, and, and that's always the case. Normally when something violent break out or something uh, physical break out, it's just a bunch of built up frustration because of, our conditions because of our position because of the state that we done put ourselves in you know and, and a lot of times that stays with you because you have nowhere else to release it you know and then when you finally get into a physical conversation it all comes out so like i say it was popping off on there i mean left and right i always you know what i'm saying had my head on the swivel you know and that's a big thing with people coming out of prison when you Especially when you've been in there as long as I have. That was like one of the first things that was going on with me when I got out here. When I go up in places like Walmart or up in stores. Uh, or, or in, I just felt so uncomfortable because there's so many moving parts around me. And I still get a little bit of that type of anxiety being in places like that. And, I, and to this day, almost two years I've been out here, I still don't go or, or haven't probably been in big spots like Walmart or, 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 or big big stores or anything like that by myself, but maybe a couple of times. Normally, I have somebody with me, a family member or whatever, whatever. And I wasn't even really conscious of that till lately, you know. But I just, I don't feel fully comfortable in those type of atmospheres, you know, right now, to this stage right now. Because you got people in there that, you know, you can see it on TikTok and social media. They get the arguing and screaming in there for the foolish stuff or fighting or get loud with you. And I don't, I don't want them type of confrontations, man, because I don't know how I'm going to respond. So I try to mind my business and keep it pushing. But, yeah, I, I know it might be even a little bit more difficult for other people, but I feel like I'm handling it to the best of my ability and I'm adjusting, you know, even more each and every day. But um, it comes from the environment that I come out of. Because like I say, when you got a lot of people around in that type of environment, normally, you know, something is going to happen. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen, but something's going to happen. So like I say, it, that's that, that that's what was going on up there. Then you had the dudes, you got the, the um, you got the struggle for the drug game, man. Dudes want to, they want to get high. Then you got dudes that get drugs and then they got to be able to fend off the dudes that don't have money who want to get high. They got to be able to fend off the jack boys. You got jack boys in prison too. You got dudes that if you get 
some drugs or you get anything, you get a store box, you get anything of value. If you're not mad enough to maintain it, they coming and get it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, they coming and get it. So you got to be willing to protect what you have with whatever you have. Because if not, there's no need for you to have anything because they coming and get it. You know, they had them dudes up there, man. They was they was going in the visiting room, making their moves, doing what they got to do, or getting it from a CEO or whatever. And man, them dudes will run down on them and, 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 and demand it. And if you weren't willing to fight and push that Bethlehem, they taking it. And I mean, to the point where they was stripping dudes in there, man. I mean, they was beating dudes up if they think the dude got the uh, package on them. He might have, you know, suitcased it. If y'all don't know what suitcase mean, that means they he, he put it in his rectum, you know. So they think he might have suitcased the package or something and acting like, I ain't got nothing, man. Y'all ain't got nothing. Man, they beat him up, script search him, and <laughs> go up in there and get it, man. Go up in Yeah, it was going down on there like that. So dudes that could not secure what they had, normally they didn't get it. But if they wanted it themselves so bad, they would get it and give it to somebody else that had the muscle, the courage, the heart to protect it. And, and, and so for doing that, they would you know, be compensated. They'll be able to get what they wanted. They'll get a portion of it. They'll get a cut of it or whatever. So that, that was a, it was a lot of that going on, I noticed when I first got there. So like I say, you learning all of this stuff and you learning it fast and you got to be on the ball and you got to know what's going on and you got to try to, you know, be in your space, you know, solidify who you are, you know, uh, uh, run your whatever you running with an iron fist and let it be known that this is how I'm coming. If you mess with me, it's going to be problems, period. And, you know, you can't just say it. You got to be willing to stand behind it. So when the first um, situation arises, you got to handle it and you got to handle it emphatically because you actually is sending a message to the rest of the compound that this is what you get when you deal with me. And man, I can remember when my first incident came, man, it came from, like I say, the foolishness, me running the store box. And it doesn't matter how much it is, if somebody owe you something and they don't pay you, then that's just a, a assault to your character. And it's an assault to your reputation, so you got to deal with it. So I can remember the dude, man, he do want no, he, he want nothing, but just maybe slightly bigger than me. And I can remember he owed me something, man. It won't too much money. It couldn't have been no more than about six or seven dollars. And he just kept delaying me and delaying me. And I'm trying to work with him because he was giving me like, oh no, man, my money, my. It wasn't like he was coming like on some. I'm taking this type of stuff. So I was working with him, but then I was getting frustrated with him. So when I pulled up on him the last time that I pulled up on him, and I asked him, I mean, what's 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 up, man? I see you because I see him going back and forth. You know, in the park eating stuff. So I said, man, I see you, uh, you know, eating and everything, man, but you ain't paid me, man. What's up? So he just broke Western with me off the rip. He told me, man, I said I'm going to pay you, man. So I said, hold on, bro. You better lower your voice. Who you think you talking to? So he said, I'm talking to you. You know, and then he hit me with the... <laughs> the worst thing you could ever hear out your, out somebody's mouth when they owe you some money. Man, you keep on pressing me, you ain't getting nothing. I said, man, you got to be crazy. And I did something that I should never do. And I learned not to never do it. Instead of punching them in the face, I slapped them. Bah! You know? And you don't slap no man, first of all. And you don't do it in prison because everything could be deadly, potentially life, you know, or death. So you don't slap a man. If you're going to put your hand on a man, you put him to the ground. So I slapped him. And man, when I slapped him, bah! he bagged up and pulled out an ice pick. And I ain't even see it at first because I'm giving it an advance on him. But when I give it an advance on him, before I can know it, I look in his hand and he reaching to poke that joint. I was like, oh. The bank is special. Yeah, pure delicious. Pure delicious. Coming out here after 30 years, yeah, I ain't got nothing, but I'm gonna have something because I'm rich in personality, you know, and uh, I'm rich in love, my family love me, and that really, that's, that's really the, all that counts.